Thank you, folks. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter number 2. John, chapter number 2. The title of the message is Dirty Lessons. Dirty Lessons. John, chapter number 2. Let's read a few verses together. I'm going to start reading at verse number 1. John 2, 1 says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants that drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, than that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine unto now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. The title of the message is Dirty Lessons. You might wonder at the title of the sermon. Be honest, I created it, and I wonder at it too. Is there anything spiritual that you could say after you title a message? Dirty lessons. Well, I believe there is. As a matter of fact, I think there's several lessons that we can learn from dirt itself. And believe it or not, that's what I want to preach to you about this morning. Lessons that we can learn about dirt. However, to make it more palatable, I'm not going to often refer to the topic as dirt. I'll refer to it as clay. This morning, let's see if we can learn four important lessons about clay. Each point, if I say it correctly, I'm going to start off with the phrase, just to help you remember, clay vessels. Clay vessels. First thought, I want you to get this morning, first lesson, I want you to get clay vessels, at least ones in the Bible, often speak of people. Clay vessels, at least the ones in the Bible, often speak of people. Uh, you're probably aware of much of what I'm going to say, but let me just remind you by giving you some Bible verses. First Bible verse I want to give to you is historic. You don't need to turn there. Matter of fact, you'll want to keep your place probably in John chapter 2 most of the morning. In Genesis 2, 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Sometimes we forget, but when we're talking about dirt, when we're talking about clay vessels, that's literally what you and I are made out of. We're made of the dust of the ground, of the dirt, of the earth, of clay, if you please. Science usually does catch up with the Bible sooner or later. Now they have the ability, the technology, to look to see what elements, things are made up of. And it's kind of interesting, but the human body is actually made of the same elements as the earth's crust. Doesn't surprise a Christian. Christians understand that's where we came from. We literally were fashioned by the dirt of this earth by the hands of God. And what makes us different from the dirt is not what we started with. What makes us different from the, from the earth is the breath of life that God breathed into us. Kind of hard to be too proud when you remember where you came from. You came from the dirt of the earth. But not only does history tell us that we came from the dirt of the earth, historical Bible verses, but Bible verses that describe us in our present state refer to us as dirt as well. Book of Psalm chapter 103 verse 14 says, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are but dust. It's not just what we were, it's what we are. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God remembers where he got us from. We're not much, folks. We can't endure much. We can't stand much because our frame's not made out of very much. We're just dirt. 
And yet the Bible tells us not just where we came from, what we are. It tells us what we're going to be again in the future. Genesis 3.19, God is actually describing the curse. And the last part of the curse put upon man was, For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Quite often ministers, when they perform funerals, will actually quote that phrase. From dust we came, and to dust we return. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Truth of the matter is, we are vessels of clay. Now look at the text, John chapter number 2, and notice that Jesus is about to perform a miracle, and the miracle that He's going to perform deals with clay pots, pots of earth, of stone. Look what it says in verse number 6. It says, And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. He's about to perform a miracle, and he's going to use these six water pots, these stone pots, to perform his miracle. We'll talk about the miracle a little bit later on in some lessons that I believe God wants us to learn. But I want you to consider just the pots for a few moments. Number one, would you consider the number of pots that were sitting there? Bible tells us there were six pots sitting there. Book of Revelation chapter 13 verse number 18 tells us what the number of man is. You're probably familiar with it. It's the number six. In the end of the age, the Antichrist will actually use the number six three times. Six, six, six. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13, 18, that is the number of man. Isn't it interesting that there were six water pots sitting there. Not only do you need to count them, but you need to consider their composition. What were they made of? The Bible says they were made of stone. Well, what in the world stone? It's just dirt. It's just earth that's hardened. So the composition of these water pots is of dirt. You need to count them. You need to consider their, uh, their composition. But number three, you also need to consider their cast. They are cast in stone. They're made in stone. Rock Hard stone. You ever heard anybody refer to another person as being headstrong or hard-hearted? Why do we make reference to people by terminology of hard or of stone? It's because we can be stubborn. We can be cast as stubborn as rock is cast. One other thing that we ought to consider, those six water pots will eventually be filled with water. The contents will be that of water. Water's very natural. It's very common. Matter of fact, three-fourths of the earth's crust is covered with water. Not only so, but you're mostly made up of water. <laughs> kind of surprising, but the human body, 57 to 65% of the human body is nothing but water. If you're a baby, an infant, you're made up of 75 to 78% water. You wonder why the older you get, the more you sag? Well, your water's dropping. That's, that's, you're sloshing is what's happening. And the older you get, the more you tend to slosh. Now, you consider those four elements about those pots, and Jesus is about to perform a miracle with those six pots of stone, which are going to be filled with water, and they're hard. And he's not only going to perform a miracle with those stones, he's going to teach us a lesson with those stones. He's going to teach us a dirty lesson, a lesson about dirt. First thought I want you to get is clay vessels, at least those in the Bible, often speak of God's use of people. The second thought that I want you to get, second lesson I want you to get, is actually going to come from the book of Jeremiah. Now keep your place at the book of John because I'm coming back to it, but go to, the, to Jeremiah chapter 18. Clay vessels are often molded by God. Clay vessels are often molded by God. So clay vessels can represent us, can represent people. I think quite often in the Bible they do. But not only can they represent us, God molds them. He shapes them. He makes them. Jeremiah chapter 18, starting at verse number 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemeth good to the potter to make. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, 
Cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. You don't have to be a preacher to figure out what's taking place in the book of Jeremiah. There God's using the potter and the clay to teach Jeremiah and the nation of Israel a lesson. Jeremiah goes and he watched the potter work for a while. The potter gets play. He shapes it. He molds it into some type of a design. He's not pleased with the design that he makes, so he folds it in on top of itself and he starts again to make a new image out of it. What does that story represent? Well, the potter is God and the clay is Israel. All you have to do is read verse number 6. It's pretty self-explanatory. God says, Can I not do with you, O Israel, that which I desire? What's he telling Jeremiah? He's telling Jeremiah that I'm the one who shapes the nation of Israel. And if Israel does not shape up, does not do what I want it to do, I can't, and he uses this word in verse number 7, I can destroy it. I can fold it in on top of itself and make it a new image. So what's he telling us in that visual message? He's telling us that God shapes things. Just like the potter shapes clay, God shapes nations. And just like God shapes nations, God shapes people. I'm going to say something. It might not sound pleasant when I first say it, but I want you to think about it. Everything that's ever happened in your life, everything that's ever happened in your life, whether good or bad, has been part of the process of God molding and shaping you. Everything that has ever happened in your life, whether it be good or bad, has been part of the process of God molding and shaping you. Now, for some of you, you can look back on your life and you have said amen because you see the hand of God at work in your life. However, for some who may be listening here or may see or listen to this message someplace else, that thought might not sit very well with them. Because the truth of the matter is some folks have had some very bad lives. They've had some very hard lives. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that the reason most people today who call themselves atheists or agnostics are actually atheists or agnostics is not because of science. <laughs> Friend, science will never prove evolution. Science, science will always point you back to a creator, an intelligent designer. Science is not the reason why anybody is an atheist. The reason why people are atheists or agnostics is because they're mad at God. Their thought is, if there is a God, He's not treated me fairly. So when I make a statement like this, every Thing, whether it's good or bad that's happened in your life, it's God's process of molding. Somebody's going to say, exactly. That's the reason I don't think there's a God. Or that's exactly the reason why I figure if there's a God, He doesn't care, He doesn't love, He doesn't have any power. But I want you to realize a little bit more with that same thought. Not only is He using those things in the design to mold and to shape you, but He's not the only one who has a part in deciding what elements mold and shape your life. Now, he's using everything. And I don't want you to get the idea that I'm trying to defend God. Because, friend, God doesn't need to be defended. But I do want you to think some more thoughts. See, a lot of folks, they hear that first thought. God uses everything to shape and mold. And they just want to shake their fist in God's face. But you also need to be aware, he's not the only one that picks the elements that are a part of the process that shapes and molds your life. I'll give you three that also help. Number one, sin. Number two, Satan. Number three, self. Those three elements also have a part in deciding what type of elements come into your life to shape you and to mold you. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but you're born into a sinful world. Some people get so mad at God, they, they hate God, shake their fist in His face because as infants, as children, they were abused or they were oppressed or, or they were sometime, some, some, somehow hurt. And I, I hate that. I, I hate that we live in a world that picks on the young and that picks on the pure 
and that picks on the weak. But that's just the sinful world that we live in. And God does not bring those elements into your life. However, God does use those elements to shape and to mold you. First one is sin. Second one is Satan. If sin wasn't bad enough, here you've got this terrible power, this person of design and intellect who craftily uses sin against the people on this planet. It's an amazing thing to me how much love this world has for the devil. Friend, the devil's got no love for you at all. Uh, his design is to destroy you. And most of the ills of your life, especially those things that happened when you were young, those things that happened when you were just a child, sin and Satan is responsible for most of those. But then the third element is self. You know, it's hard to work with clay when clay is willful, when clay is stubborn. Now, a, a good potter, he can take some stiff clay and he can make it limber. He can take some limber clay and he can make it stiff. He can take some clay that's got rocks and impurities in it and he can pull it out. But folks, I got to tell you, when the, when the clay has flesh and bones, as the potter does all that work, it's got to cause some pain and it's got to cause some hurt. And sadly, sometimes it's self-inflicted pain. It's because we chose to do what we wanted to do instead of what God wanted us to do. But I still go back to the same thought. <laughs> hey, the th same thought is whatever has happened in your life, whatever, whether it's good or bad, God has used those things to shape you, to mold you. Why? Because he's the master potter. You're the vessel of clay. The lesson that you need to learn is that God shapes the clay. God takes vessels of human flesh and He uses the events of their life to shape and to mold them. Somebody says, well, preacher, couldn't God, couldn't God do something about all the wrong in this world? Couldn't God do something about the starvation and the abuse and, and the neglect and the, the sinfulness and the evil and the oppression? Couldn't God fix all that? Yes, He could. God could fix it in a second. All he's got to do is take away our free will. All God's got to do is just say, all right, you don't get to choose anymore. However, as long as there's sin and free will, there's going to be heartache. There's going to be hurt. The beauty of our God is God is able to take the heartache and the hurt and he's able to use it to shape and to mold the vessel of clay into something still glorious and something that he can still use. What kind of lessons can we learn from dirt? Number one, we need to learn that clay vessels, at least those in the Bible, often speak of people. Number two, we need to learn that clay vessels can be molded by God. Number three, we need to learn that clay vessels can be changed by Jesus. Go back to our text, John chapter number two. Left you there with a, a miracle about to be performed. And what a miracle it is. This is the first miracle that Jesus ever performed, the Bible tells us. Jesus has been invited to a, to a wedding. His disciples are there. It's obvious that Jesus wasn't known at that time. He hadn't done any miracles. He wasn't well known. Uh, he was there. Some of his disciples were there. But it's obvious also that Mary's the one who's in charge. I, I don't know if she was the wedding planner. I don't know if she just was very close to the bride and the groom or the family. But she was aware of the situation that was brewing. She knew that they did not have any more beverage to serve. And so she speaks to Jesus. And she more or less indicates, I know you can do something about this. And then she turns to the servants. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Now, you got to understand, uh, I don't worship Mary, but you got to give that dear lady a little bit of credit right there. She'd never seen him perform a miracle in her life, but she knew he could fix this problem. The only way he's going to fix this problem by doing a miracle. Well, obviously... One of the main points in Jesus doing this miracle was to help out this family. I mean, they're about to go through a very precious time, a wedding. We've had a few of those, about five of them, I think, if I'm counting right. It, you don't really want to have a catastrophe on the day of a wedding. So one of the things that Jesus did that day by performing this miracle was he helped out a wedding planner, okay? Whoever was designing this wedding and making the prayer, whoever was in charge, he helped somebody out. He was able to get the beverage, best beverage they'd ever had. He was able to take care of that. But I'm telling you, I think he was trying to teach us some lessons about the clay vessels too. 
There were six of them sitting over there. They were stone, well cast. He's going to have them filled with water. But he's going to perform a miracle that will teach us an important lesson. What's the lesson? That Jesus can change the clay vessels. The water that was put in those vessels had to be pretty good water. The Bible tells us these vessels themselves were some of the best vessels that you could find in Israel. They were vessels that were being set apart for God's use. They were set apart for purification. What does that mean? Were they going to be used for God somehow? I don't know where the clay came from that made them. Maybe it was a special clay pit. I don't know what stone they had used, what they had done to, to make these vessels this way, but they had taken these vessels and they had set them apart and they were going to use these vessels. For, somebody prayed over these vessels. Somebody had separated these vessels. These represent the best vessels that Israel has. They're what you would call holy vessels. They're being purified for God's service. My own thought is Jesus probably had the best water poured into them. Uh, again, I don't know. Uh, clean water. Maybe water that had been filtered. Maybe water that was going to be used inside those vessels for some type of a holy purpose. Together between the holy vessel and the water that was to be poured into that vessel. What we have sitting beside the wall there, we've got six clay pots that represent the best clay pots Israel's got. Together, they speak of the best people we've got on this planet. I'm talking about the good people, the moral people. Those that clean their lives up. Those that follow the rules. Those that are faithful. Those that are decent. These represent the best vessels we've got. Yet the best vessels we've got still needed to be touched and changed by Jesus Christ. The substance that was going to be poured into those vessels was water. Water is a great beverage. We all need water. I've already indicated we're made mostly of water. Largely of water. We don't exist very long without water. People get a little bit concerned if they don't eat in 24 hours. They're afraid they'll starve to death. Listen, you can go weeks, maybe even a month or more without having any food in your stomach, but you can't go but a, a week probably at the most without having some water because you're made mostly of water. And yet, as precious as water is, as common as water is, Jesus didn't want to serve water at this feast. Something needed to take place to change the contents of what was going to be served at this feast. And Jesus changed the contents. Now, this is the type of a passage, I'd, I'd just like to stop and preach on it for a while, but I don't have time. But there's so many truths that you need to see here. For example, you'll notice that what Jesus changed was not on the outside. What He changed was on the inside. As a matter of fact, those that were the closest to the vessels those servants that were picking the vessels up and transporting them to the governor of the feast, they were the closest to the vessel. They had their hands on the vessel. They had their eyes on the vessel. They knew what was going on, but they couldn't tell any change had taken place to the vessel. It wasn't until somebody examined the inside of the vessel that they could tell, hey, there's been a change here. Could I just tell you when Jesus touches somebody? He's not nearly as much worried about the outside as he is changing the inside. People around you might not even be able to tell the change, at least not right away. They might be used to seeing you the way you look. They might be used to hearing the way you talk. They might not be able to tell anything's changed at all. But I'm telling you, if Jesus changes the vessel, Jesus changes from the inside out. And I noticed not only did he change on the inside, I noticed he took something that was natural a element, if you please, of our world, something that was lifeless, and he changed it to something that was organic, something that came from life. He touched that which had no life, and he blessed it and changed it so that it did have life. Jesus Christ, when he touches a human vessel, he gives you a new kind of life. He gives you spiritual life. That which is on the inside, that which is dead, He changes that which is dead and He makes it life. And the third thing I noticed, the third thing I noticed was He changed the water into wine, but the wine never changed back to water. When Jesus changes something, He changes it forever. You don't have to worry about reverting back to the old. 
Once Jesus touches the clay vessel, what has been changed stays changed. This and so many other truths. But let me tell you the most important truth about Jesus changing the vessel. The change that He made to that vessel is the change that needs to be made in your life. You need to be touched. You need to have your insides touched by Jesus Christ. You need His life. You say, well, preacher, why? Well, the Bible tells us if you're not changed, if you're still in your natural state, still a natural vessel filled with a natural spirit, that you're at odds with God, that you're literally at war with God. Romans 5.10 says you are an enemy with God. You're a combatant with God Himself. What in the world are you fighting about? Well, you're fighting about who's going to operate this vessel. Who's going to rule the vessel that you're living inside of? If you don't want God to rule in your life, you don't have to have God to rule in your life. If you don't want to be a friend of God, you don't have to be a friend. God has given you that free will that I talked about earlier. And if you want to remain in your natural state, if you want to be at war with God all of your life, God lets you do that. However, you need to understand something. If you die separated from God, you're going to spend eternity separated from God. And if you're one of those that likes to say things like this, God hasn't treated me fairly in this life. I don't like what God has done with me in this life. Friend, I got news for you. If you don't like what God's done for you in this life and you die separated from God, you're really going to have something to bellyache about because you're sure not going to like spending eternity separated from God. The most important truth you need to get, the most important lesson you need to get is you need to be touched by God. You need to be changed. How can I be changed by God? Well, it's quite simple. Two-step process. Number one, you need to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. You need to believe that Jesus is God. You need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. You need to believe that he rose the third day. You need to believe that he ascended back up into heaven. You need to believe that if you let him into your heart, he will save you. We talk in Baptist circles, in Christian circles, about faith. Faith is simply believing. It's believing what the Bible says. If you want Jesus to touch you, to change you, you've got to have faith. You've got to believe what the Bible says. But that's not all. Faith needs repentance. You also need to surrender yourself to Jesus Christ. The best you know how, yield yourself to Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Just means you're going to be changed. You're going to be different. Going to be a different head over your life, a different ruler, a different master in your life. Now, instead of you deciding what will take place in your life, Jesus Christ will make the decisions for your life. Those two steps together faith and repentance produces something that the human mind can barely comprehend. It's called the new birth. It's called being born again. It's called being saved. You need to be saved so that you can be changed by Jesus Christ. What lesson do I learn from John chapter number 2? I learned an important lesson. I learned that Jesus can change the contents of the clay vessels. What dirty lessons do we learn? Well, number one, we learn that clay vessels in the Bible can speak of people. Number two, that clay vessels are molded by God. Number three, that clay vessels need to be changed. And number four and last, that clay vessels need to be broken. Take your Bible. Go over the book of Judges, chapter number seven. You don't need John chapter two again. I won't come back. But look at John chapter, excuse me, Judges chapter number seven. It's interesting. Once you come to the understanding that clay vessels can represent people, can represent what God does with people. Then different Bible passages that you've read all your life change meaning just a little bit. For example, in the book of Judges, chapter number 7, we've got here Gideon, and he's fighting against the Midianites. And and you remember Gideon was called while he was threshing wheat. Midianites, the Bible describes their army as being without number, as the sands of the seashores. Gideon, when he first steps onto the scene, is so afraid of the Midianites, he's threshing wheat inside of a wine press. That's kind of like trying to thresh wheat inside of a silo. He's gone inside of there where the Midianites won't see him. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose. It takes a lot of convincing to get Gideon on the same page with God, but finally he does. And so he puts together a little army. It's too big, 32,000. God widows it down, winnows it down, makes it just 300 men. Goes from zero to 32,000, back down to 300. 
And pick up reading, if you would, in Judges chapter 7, look at verse number 16, where Gideon begins to describe what we're going to do. He says, and he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a pitcher in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Now there's going to be four things that each one of these 300 men will carry. They'll carry a pitcher, they'll carry a lantern, they'll carry a trumpet, and they'll carry a sword. <laughs> they're going to have their hands full. I mean, that's four things they got to carry. Make it a little bit easier to carry now. They're going to put their, their lanterns inside their pitchers, their clay pots, their clay vessels. It's going to do two things. Number one, it's going to make it easier for them to carry. Now instead of two things, or four in all, they're only going to carry three. They'll put their sword in their sheath. They'll be able to carry the pitcher in one hand that's got the lantern and the trumpet in the other. So it makes it a little bit easier to carry. But it also hides the flame from the enemy. Now the enemy can't see as 300 men begin to surround their huge camp. Look what the Bible says happens in verse number 19. So Gideon and the 100 men that were with him, he divided the 300 into three companies, each company having 100 men, came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with them. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. Now this particular lesson is for the Christians. What he's describing here is that clay vessels need to be broken. Clay vessels need to be... By now, surely we understand we're the clay vessel. We're the ones made out of clay. We're made of the dust, the dirt of this earth. We're the clay vessels. But Gideon took a light and put the light inside the clay vessel. Jesus in John chapter 9, verse number 5 says, As long as I am in the, in the world, I am the light of the world. What's the light a picture of Jesus? Where is the light? It's in the clay vessel. Where is Jesus right now? John chapter 3 verse number 20. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come unto him and will sit with him and sup with him. Where is Jesus right now? He's inside the clay vessel. Problem. As long as Jesus is inside the clay vessel, the clay vessel blocks the light. Now that was no problem for Gideon. Gideon actually wanted to have a surprise attack. So he lit the lanterns and he put the lanterns inside the clay pots. And now it's easier to carry and now the enemy cannot see them moving about. And Gideon stations his 300 men all around this huge camp. And each man has has a trumpet and he has a lantern and he has a clay pot and his sword fastened to his belt. And when Gideon sounds the trumpet, he breaks the lantern. Excuse me, he breaks the pitcher. And now the light of the lantern can be seen by the camp. And everybody else seeing what Gideon does, they do the same thing. The Bible says the Midianites, who are being awoken out of a deep sleep, they look around, they hear the trumpet, they hear 300 trumpets going off at once. They just assume, well, there's 300 trumpets. Not only are there 300 trumpets, but there's 300 different guys holding on to their lanterns. And their thought is, well, if they got 300 guys doing nothing but blowing trumps, and 300 guys out there doing nothing but holding the light, they must have thousands of guys carrying the swords. So the Bible says they get up and they begin to scatter. They flee, crying, fearing they're going to be slain. There's only 300 guys, and they're doing double tasks. They're actually going to do triple tasks, because now they've got to pull the sword out, and they've got to go out there and start doing the fighting. But the assumption of the Midianites is... what? Well, they got that many folks doing nothing but blowing trumpets. They must have at least 300 companies of soldiers. They must have at least 300 companies behind each one of those lanterns. They just assumed they were about to die. However, that served Gideon's purpose quite well. For the time being, the light needed to be hid by the clay pitcher. However, for us Christians, it does no good for us to have the light of God on the inside and for it not to be able to be seen on the outside. You see, to me, Christians, 
are like some of the disciples of Jesus. They're secret disciples. Uh, they're disciples, yeah, they've got Jesus living on the inside, but the clay vessel is hiding the light. Are, are you one of God's battalions of secret disciples, secret servants? If you are, you need to get lesson number four. What's lesson number four? Lesson number four is clay vessels need to be broken. At what point did they break the vessels? They break the vessels when it's time for the battle to begin. Folks, I got news. The trumpet sounded a long time ago. The battle is well underway. It's time for the people of God to let the light shine. Is that not what Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 5? I'm amazed at how much that verse keeps coming to my mind while I preach. But he says, nobody lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. That would be a straw basket. Neither do they light a bushel and put it under a clay pitcher. They take the light and they put it upon a candlestick so that all the world may see. What is the lesson that we can learn about the clay vessel? Clay vessels need to be broken. How do I become broken for God? Two thoughts and I'll hush. Number one, the things of God and the needs of others need to become more important to us than our own things need to be important to us. The things of God and the needs of others need to become more important to us than our own things are. You know, we're living in a world that's hurting all around us. The more I preach, the more I realize that even the sermons that I preach probably hurt someone who's listening to it. I can't preach an abortion of a church this large without assuming there are several folks in here who have had an abortion. I can't preach on divorce on a congregation this large and not assume many folks in this sanctuary have gone through a divorce. I can't preach on abuse in a sanctuary this large without assuming that several have been abused. The more I preach, the more I'm aware that the ravages of this world is hurt even this fellowship. If it has hurt this fellowship, how many more are the people outside the walls of this church whose sin and Satan and selfishness have ravished and hurt? We're living in a most unusual age, and yet we are by far the most blessed generation that's ever lived. We have more. We do more. We know more. We see more. We enjoy more. We live more than any generation has ever lived before us. And I don't think God doesn't want us to enjoy the things that He's given us, but I think that He does want us to put His concerns and the concerns of others above ourselves. And if we can't see the needs of others, I don't think we're ever going to get to the place where we're broken again. Number one, we need to be broken by understanding the importance of the things of God and the needs of others. Number two, we need to be broken by surrendering ourselves to Jesus Christ. The whole key of serving Jesus is to surrender to Jesus. I preach sermon after sermon. Most of you here, most all of them. And I know they have an effect. But the only real effect that counts is the change that they make in your heart. I like it when I preach. and Somebody comes up and says, Preacher, I didn't know that. I, I appreciate that. I learned something today. I was challenged today. But friend, all that you learn and all the emotions that you might experience really amounts to nothing unless it moves you closer to Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm not preaching to tickle your ears. I'm not preaching to stimulate your brain. I'm not even preaching for your enjoyment or your entertainment. This morning, I think God would have me to preach to challenge you to surrender to Him. Because there's a world, especially this season of the world, there's a season and a, and, and a world out there that's hurting beyond anybody's imagination. And what they need is a few clay pots that are broken. A few clay pots that they can see the light of Jesus Christ shining through. This morning, we need to learn some dirty lessons. Some lessons about dirt. Because we are the vessels of clay. 
and because God wants to accomplish something with us in this world today. Let's pray together. Father,